Hello and welcome to session 35 of my Pillars of Eternity lore through. We are currently in Deerford Village, uh, where we have been hearing about a missing woman whose name is... Let's see. Nope, not there. Lord Heron's daughter. Oh, her, oh, here he is. Lady Aelis Heron is missing. Um, and we are in the inn now where uh, her father is. So we're going to find out a little bit more about that. In this village, we also ran into the grieving mother. We got a quest to recover, not recover, to get a dragon egg for the local apothecary. And to take care of an ogre who supposedly has been stealing um, a local swine herd's swine <clears throat> um but i don't know it seemed kind of sketchy so it might be something else going on there all right let's go check out this inn this table has been scarred and stained from decades of use i just want to find her surely even you can understand that we're decent folk my lord perhaps you should leave and check the wilds Oh, there goes her father. Oh, he's just hanging out over there now. Um, this portrait depicts a man and woman dressed in Edir garb that would have been in style a century ago. The heavy frame has been battered and the plate that once bore the patron's name has been scratched out. They share a passionate embrace, embrace which seems at odds with the disgust on their faces. I wonder if we can see that. Looks like a cover of some kind of romance novel or something. You can see that in the upper uh, portion of the screen there. Let's talk to Sid. Welcome. A redhead stands by the fire, turning her lute, tuning her lute and plucking its strings. She she hums snatches of a melody as she goes. First time at Dracogen. Dracogen? Dracogen? Normally I'd have a song ready, but I haven't quite worked out this tune yet. I'm writing some chants, chants about the founding of this inn. Say, so, you interested in the story? I hadn't finished the chants, but I could tell you all the same. Sure, let's have it. Oh, excellent. These rustic fables are always great fun, says Kana. Let me get out something to write with. It was built in the time of Hadrid's Rebellion, and a dear and lady, and a dear and lady Thanu once had a keep here. One of the towers still stands, but the rest is said to be buried under the village. Anyway, she stuck to the side of the Empire, and the contingent of Duke Hadrid's Knights of the Crucible helped the farmers and colonists in the area turn, to keep, turn her keep to rubble. Uh, so we saw that ruined tower outside. Um, so it seems like that is attached to some kind of underground fortress or something like that. Also, it sounds like the typical inn music is playing here, like someone is playing a lute. But here we are talking with the bard of the inn. And she said she hasn't actually written anything yet. So um, this must just be generic music that plays. Um, and is not actually diegetic. I always considered it diegetic, or it is supposed to be diegetic, and it's just a little bit of a bug that it's playing now. This inn is the first building that sprang up from the ruin, built from some of the same bricks the colonists had pulled from Lady Thanu's castle, they say. Supposedly, the quarterstaff of her chief wizard even got lost in the construction, mortared into a wall or nailed under a floorboard. Anyway, the inn was supposed to be a haven and a meeting place where the locals built their new town. What do you mean, supposed to be? Dear Woodens are an ornery lot, and the more these new neighbors met, met, the more they argued. They realized they didn't agree on much being oust beside ousting the old lord. The biggest divide was over the Glanfothans and their nearby ruins. Hadrid's knights and their supporters wanted to keep the peace, but a group of misfits with more anarchic leanings, anarchic leanings than that had formed in town wanted to go after the tribes the same way they'd gone after their lord. Soon, the villagers were fighting each other as much as with the Adherans. In the end, memories of the Broken Stone War and the War of Black Trees were fresh enough that the Duke's soldiers won the day. Most of the other villagers came around eventually, but some of the core troublemakers left to join the front lines of war defiance, I've heard, found their way into the Guided Compass, the most forward-looking of the Glenfothan tribes. I don't know if I believe that part myself, but it makes a good story. She points to the east wall. There's a portrait of one of the chief rabble-rousers and his rival in the peacekeeping faction. Someone's idea of a joke. I don't think they were particularly amused. I think she is talking about this um, 
pseudo romantic portrait over here kind of making fun of the uh of, of the two people that were in conflict um i don't need to hear any more about the broken stone war and the war of black trees very well good day stranger yeah uh let's hear what dangler has to say the innkeeper what was your exchange with that nobleman about? He looks up from polishing his tankard and glowers at the lord. Folk around, folk around here is decent. They mind their own business. You want to stick your nose in it? Go talk to him yourself. Okay. I have questions about Deerford. He runs his rag around the rim of the mug. Ask. Tell me about the village. Walk from one bridge to the next and you've seen it. We're quiet, hard-working folk. We keep to ourselves and don't take being pushed around. He glares at the well-dressed man standing off to the side. Used to be a castle here, built by some family of Adarent Thanes back when the Emperor Empire first came. Only one tower still stands, and that part—that's part of Trigal's shop now. Sid, that barred by the fire, could spin you a yarn if you're so inclined. Who lives in Deerford? Not many anymore. Hard to keep people around when everyone here is birth in Hollowborn. But we got a few who stick around to do business. Trigal's the leather courier. Hindina crafts potions, and Winfrith trades in general goods. Rumbald's a pig farmer, or was anyway. Uh, tell me about Trigal. He's a carrier, treats leather, and makes armor and a few other goods with it. Problem is, the smell of tallow and deer shit tends to put people out of, off their food. And his shop's right next door. What's Zendaya's story? The lady's a clever hand with potions and poultices. Got herself into trouble with a nest of worms, or so I hear. Her cart's in the east end of town. In Winfrith? Been around even longer than I have. Nice enough fellow, but never could find his way to the end of a sentence. His shop's around the across the square. Something happens to Rumball's pigs, I take it. Damn ogre carried him off. Now he squeals more than, he ever, more than his herd ever did, he shrugs. It's rotten luck. Let's go back to my previous questions about Deerford. You said you don't see many travelers. Of course not. Why would they come around here? We got bandits on the road and an ogre in the forest, as that yapping fool Rumball will tell you. Worse yet, he's been a healthy child born in here in over a year. Most kith that come here are just passing through. Um, it seems like they think that Deerford is alone in the Hollowborn Crisis, even though um, most places around here, if not all places around here, are subject to it. About that ogre. You don't hardly see him this close to town. Ogres and kith don't miss well. Ugly bastards, but they're smart enough to know that much. If you want to know more, talk to Rumball. It's farm southwest of here. You've already done that? Never mind, I want to talk about something else. Uh, let's see. Order some food and drinks. Let's see what he's got here. Nothing too special. Duke's own beef loaf. Next to another rice pin. It's pace. What are you doing in the kitchen? Dangler will get you sorted out with food and drink. Heavy, sweet perfumes emanate from the barrels. The stave joints are starting are stained dark brown and dull purple. Some beer there. All right, let's go talk to Lord Heron here. The man wears Edder style robes, simple but elegant. His fine leather shoes look like they were made for padding around indoors, yet they're caked with mud. He yanks at a lock of hair twined around his silk gloved finger. His fine features are etched with anxiety. My child is out there. Do they not understand? Got experience? My lord, we're doing everything we can. Unfortunately, these villagers... Beasts take them all. I don't care how you do it, but find her. I heard you arguing with the innkeeper. A petty, small-minded man. Just like the rest of them around here. I've been paying him an honest fee for board and bed, and yet he can't be bothered to stir himself to concern for my Elise. Elise. Your child is missing, I take it? Yes, Lady Elise. My daughter. He tugs at the fingertips of his gloves. I've asked around, but nobody in this mud hole has any concerns beyond their swine. They turn my men away like beggars and seem downright pleased to be of no use. But you... You're not one of my soldiers, and you look like you're used to getting your hands dirty, if you don't mind my saying so. 
His guard leans in. My lord, I... Heron raises his hand to silence the man. If you find her, he nibbles the thumb of one silk glove, tell her I won't be upset with her. She could come back and all will be well. I just want to make sure my Elise, my child, is safe. Nothing in the world is more important to me. I'd like to ask a few questions about your daughter. Elise. Of course. Describe Lady Elise. She's a striking young woman who bears more resemblance to her mother than to me. She has auburn hair and delicate, well-bred features. She must be, oh, 28 or 29 now. Doesn't know the age of his daughter? Tell me about her disappearance. We'd stopped in Deerford for a few days. On our fourth evening here, I was making plans to continue our journey. Lady Elise was feeling unwell and went to bed. When I retired a couple hours later, I found she had vanished. None of my men had seen her go, and no one at the inn knew where she was. Since then, my people have been combing the village, but we've yet to find a clue, and the locals have been no help. Why did you and Elise come to Deerford? It was merely a stop along the way to Ina's Rest. However, she took ill shortly before our arrival, so it seemed prudent to allow her a few days to recover. What's in Ina's Rest? He frowns as if about to protest, but he gives in with a sigh. Lady Elise has reached an age where it is prudent for her to marry. Given this legacy business, I can't help her fertile years slip by. I can't let her fertile years slip by. Nor do I want her womb to fester in the presence of so many Holoborn. Hell of a way to talk about your daughter there, Lord Herond. Uh, there are better roads along the coast. Wouldn't it have been easier to follow them to Ina's Rest? I thought that. I wouldn't be slogging through the forest, would I? He waves a hand. The main roads are clogged with people fleeing one way or another to try and escape Widevin's legacy. It would be difficult for a caravan like mine to pass without incident. At the time, it seemed prudent to move quietly along the back roads. It seems there would be more potential suitors in New Hamar or New Yarma. You think I haven't considered that? Arranging a suitable match is difficult. The best prospects for my child lay in Ina's rest. Uh, where's the rest of your family? Surely they wouldn't want to miss your daughter's betrothal. Lady Heron is ill-suited for travel, I'm afraid. And unfortunately, Elise has a few other close relatives. My sister and her husband, Elise's aunt and uncle, of course, have been visiting Edder this past few months. He rubs his knuckles. And as for siblings, Elise has none. My wife has only given birth to Holoborn, since Elise, that is. I see, but going back to your daughter... Let's go back to my previous questions. Tell me about yourself. I'm Lord Nestor Harrand of Defiance Bay. My family has been prominent there since Imperial times. Our primary estate is on the outskirts of Brackenbury, but we have holdings in New Haomar as well. Those went to my sister and her husband. Goodbye. So we got a new quest to search Deerford for information about Elise's disappearance. Oh. Nirfra. The Orlin hovers by the window, peering out of it every few seconds. As you enter the room, she watches you carefully, her hand hovering over her stiletto. She cranes her head to peer at you. Anyone follow you? Who sent you? What are you talking about? The man leaning against the wall glances out the door and nods to the Orlin. The hand over her weapon relaxes, but she's still watching you closely. Some old friends from Defiance Bay are looking for me. We're not exactly friends anymore, if you catch my drift. I'm just trying to lie low and mind my own business. Know what I mean? Boss, and Almara looks at the Orlin and jerks his head at you. All right, all right. She raises a hand to the Almao before turning back to you. My friend here thinks maybe you could help us out. Now, I'm sure you're a busy man, so I'll make it worth your time. She flips you a few coins. Just go take a look around town. Come back and let me know if the coast is clear or if you see any suspicious figures. You're pretty suspicious. What's this about? She scratches the back of her neck. I may have gotten myself into trouble with some powerful people in Defiance Bay. Powerful criminal people. I suppose it was bound to happen eventually. I'm a thief by trade, and it's hard to do kind of any kind of business in the city without crossing them eventually. 
Now I'm just trying to put some distance between us. I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but you don't seem like the type to run your mouth off. Very well. Admeth Hadrat Part 1, Rise to Power. Yes, here we go. So we've been looking for Part 1 because I believe we already own Part 2. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. This is stealing, so I'm not going to take that coin there, but I'm just going to read the book. Admeth Hadrat Part 1, Rise to Power. Little could one know that the man who once destroyed part of his own country with fire would become the Deerwood's most beloved leader. Martyred in the war, he started to free his people from an oppressive rule. There isn't a dear wooden who doesn't know of or revere Admeth for what he did. Strangely, even though our, there are records of his father Adrang's childhood, and even though he was raised in nobility in the Deerwood, while it was still Eder territory, information about Admeth's early years is nearly impossible to find. Admeth is not known for his childhood, though. He is known for saving the Deerwood and uniting it with its sworn enemy, the Glanthathans. In 2652 AI, the Deerwood and Troubles with their Firkening were at a boiling point. Several of the Earls under Adrang's rule, provoked by the Imperial Court in Edir, resumed looting the ruins around Deerwood that the Glanthathans held sacred. When the Glanthathans finally retaliated, it was overwhelmingly brutal and resulted in a slave uprising. Galvin Regid, whom Adrang had fought before, resumed control of the Glanfathan troops. Regid was also able to convince some Delemgen to join the fight. Uh, we've talked about some of these people before in the Deerwood history. Um, <clears throat> and I thought that there was one thing that I wanted to... Oh yeah, this is talking about when the Fairkening was secretly um, plundering the uh, Ingwithan ruins against the laws that um, Adrang Hedret had set up. Um, Adrang was, at this point, far too old to lead his forces into battle, so he sent his son Admeth in his place to contain the threat. Admeth, true to form as the son of Adrang, and obviously having learned tactics from his father, made a dangerous but effective tactical decision. In order to prevent Regis' troops from using the woods as cover and keep them from advancing through the land, set fire to the forest as tributary of the Ijwar River, and positioned his troops to prevent any of the Glanfothan forces from retreating. This tactic proved to be effective. While some Glanfothans in Delemgen were able to escape, thousands died. In the skirmish that followed, Galvin Regid was captured and sent to be held in New Hamar. Admeth was able to do what his father spent decades trying to do. He stopped Galvin Regid. This was the War of the Black Trees that we have read about before. The conflict with the Glenfathans continued for several months, and Admeth repeated the Scorched Earth tactic several times to flush the opposing forces from key battlefields. He was able to bring the conflict to an end before the year ended. While it was a win for the Deer Woodens, it was very costly as well. Because of his tactics, the conflict earned the name the War of the Black Trees. After Adrang's death in 2654, Admeth became the grave of the Deerwood to the dismay of the Imperial Court and the other Earls. Over the course of the next year, they defied his rule at every turn, rebuking his decrees and countermanding his directives. In 2655 AI, Admeth had had enough. Even though he lacked support from most of the earls, he was admired by both the Valian dukes and the common folk. Backed by his, backed by his support, backed by this support, he issued an ultimatum to the Ferkening to anoint him Grave Palatine. The Ferkening, unwilling to deal with the rebellion while trying to establish a new warless vor trade in Red Saris, Agreed. Admeth then held authority and legal power over the earls, their holdings, and their titles. The Deerwood was no longer a grave room, but was instead a palatinate. This change reduced the Ferkening's power over the region. With his new power, Admeth quickly brought the rebellious earls into line. But in exchange for the power, Admeth invested time and money into all of the Deerwood's ports and trade posts, dramatically increasing shipping traffic. This helped the Earls and brought in more money for the Ferkening. Okay, so that was just part one of um, Admeth coming into power because of his tactics in the War of Black Trees. Um, he wanted to be the grave palatine uh, of the Deerwood, and the Ferkening let him do that simply because he didn't want there to be any kind of uprising. He was hoping uh, that move would bring a little bit of peace despite it, it meaning that he also would have lost power the Ferkening would have lost some power so let's move on to part two
That one, I believe, is somewhere in my inventory. There it is. Admet Hadrit, Part 2, Rebellion. Over the five years following his ascension to the grave, Admeth attempted to mend relations with the Glanfathans and bring his land together with theirs. He enacted laws that restricted the taking of new slaves, allowing Glanfathans to buy their fellows out of bondage, and imposed a tax on slave ownership in order to promote the use of free labor. While there was some resistance to these new laws, the Farkening's attention to raid Saris and Admeth's power, backed by the colonists, made it difficult for the Earls to truly resist what was happening. In 2662 AI, the year of the 10th anniversary of the War of Black Trees, Admeth brought about the end of slavery in the Deerwood. He negotiated a series of treaties with the Glanfathans wherein a timeline was established for the official emancipation of all remaining slaves. Each owner would receive compensation in either land or money based on the number of slaves freed. If they didn't comply, the slaves would be seized and their former masters would suffer a substantial fine. In return for this, the Glanfathans opened trade routes with the Deerwood and allowed their woodens to live in and near areas that had their sacred ruins, but they are, under no conditions, to enter the ruins. As a final act of goodwill, Atmuth freed Galvin Regid, saying he had suffered sufficiently for his actions. Um, really quickly here, <clears throat> um, in the real world, this um, has uh, precedence. So it has recently, at least, I mean, not just recently, but it has been reignited recently, I think, uh, the idea of reparations for families of former enslaved people, um, for ancestors of formerly enslaved people, that is, because uh, no actual enslaved people from America are still alive. Um, but um, reparations, the idea of reparations for ancestors of those people has um, kind of reignited over the last few years, um, arguing that the people who were enslaved were people who were taken from families, were taken from lives, were taken from civilizations, um, and basically given nothing, treated horribly while they were here, and then when they were freed, it was just kind of in the way that, okay, you're free now, um, but what did they have at that point? They didn't have any money. They didn't have places to live. Um, in some cases, they were convicted of crimes and put right back into slavery. Um, but there is some precedence in the real world, too. I forget exactly where. I want to say this was in England, but I could be wrong about that. Um, where reparations were actually paid but not to the formerly enslaved but to the people who did the enslaving um thinking that the people who did the enslaving were losing some money because they were losing their enslaved people they needed to be reimbursed for this um well it, it does make a tiny bit of political sense to actually do this to encourage people to give up their enslaved people and give them some kind of reimbursement for that it is very sad that those are the people that are being reimbursed that are being given reparations for what they lost rather than the people who have nothing who now have to go and start new lives for themselves i'm not saying they are better off as enslaved people i am just saying that um, some consideration should be given to formerly enslaved people to allow them to start lives because otherwise they don't really have the resources to start their own lives and they need those resources so that money definitely should have been spent on the formerly enslaved people i understand that this probably would in this world and probably and maybe where they did that in the real world that this would have started a lot of conflicts and they might have been bloody um but I don't know, just as, as, as just as thinking as compassion goes and as what is right goes, I think that would be that would have been the right way to go about it rather than giving the people who were enslaving people reimbursement for the, losing those enslaved people um, and burst, they would rather uh, give something to the formerly enslaved people for the years, if not generations of brutal work and treatment that they were put through okay uh moving on with uh Admeth hadrat he freed galvin regid 
and he outlawed slavery, and he outlawed the plundering of Ingwithan ruins, um, which obviously the Glenfathans were happy about these things. The Ferkening, seeing he was completely out of control in his own Palatinate, devised a plan to get the supply of ancient artifacts running again. He approached the Earl suffering under Admeth's rule and convinced them to hire agents to raid the ruins. Initially, they did so in secret, but they quickly became sloppy, eventually being caught. This breach of treaties incited Glenfathan again to acts of violence while Admeth researched who was behind it. With the help of Glenfathan leaders, Admeth found evidence that pointed back to the Ferkening as the source of the raids. That was the beginning of the end for Adiran rule in the Deerwood. Over the next seven years, Admeth and the Ferkening maneuvered around each other, playing political, economic, and military games in order to gain the upper hand. In 2668 AI, Admeth declared the Deerwood had had enough. The Ferkening would no longer be recognized. The Deerwood was now a free entity, entity and would govern itself. This started the War of Defiance, which lasted five years. The end result of the war was freedom for the Deerwood, and though Duke Hadrit would never live to see it come to a close, the people of Deerwood consider him the founder of the country nevertheless. Uh, so yeah, his rebellion eventually led to the freedom of the Deerwood. <clears throat> um, and the Glenfothans and former Adiran people who are here now form their own nation. Uh, because of Ad Admeth Hadrit's rebellion. Even though he didn't survive to the end of it, it was still because of his actions that Deerwood has been freed. Okay, um, super interesting stuff. Very important to the lore, if that's not clear already. So um, I'm so glad that we found that extra book, that, that book here, um, just to give us a little bit more color into the uh, history of the Deerwood. <clears throat> Okay, so moving on, we are um, looking a little bit for Lady Elise. Uh, Elise, I think that was the name. I can do that. That's settled. Not stealing. I can do that. That's settled. Glass of this window is broken and warped. Knotted planks have been nailed over it. I think I can even see it there. The many faces of Bereth and the moons of Aora. Okay, love this. New book to read. We, ha we have already read the many faces of Bereth, but not the moons of Aora. Look up into the night sky and you'll see the moon, and you'll see the moon Balafa. Ubiquitous and persistent, she remains forever in view, but also out of reach. What many people do not know, however, is that our world is actually orbited by two moons, Balafa and Kalda. Balafa. Hanging low and large in the sky, Balafa travels swiftly in her race around the world, completing an orbit in about 18 days. This proximity and speed can cause extreme tide conditions in some areas, making the sea shift so quickly and rise so high that there are some beautiful coastal areas that are virtually uninhabitable for a good portion of the year. Before we learned the truth about the cause of the tides, legend held that Andra, the goddess of the sea, was in love with the moon, and when she saw it in the sky, the tides, great waves, and violent storms that happened were her attempts to reach it. This is why the moon is formally called Sin Balafa or Andran Balafa, the beloved or Andra's beloved. Um, so yeah, it's always interesting here for me to realize that even in a world where gods are real, where things that we would consider supernatural are real, like the soul, um, they still come up with supernatural explanations for normal things. And here... Um, before they realized the relation of the moon to tides, they thought it was because Andra, god of the sea, was in love with the moon and just like almost became enraged when she saw the moon. Um, and that was what was causing these crazy tides. Um, Calda. 315 years ago, the Grand Empire of Valia suffered from terrible storms and terrifyingly high and low tides. Records show the same thing was happening in the Adir Empire and several new and that several new Adiran colonies along the Deerwood coast were completely destroyed by storms and high tides that engulfed the settlements. At that time, during an eclipse, Glenfothan astronomers spotted something small orbiting the, near the edge of Balafa. After much study, they realized it was a small satellite with an extremely irregular orbit. 
They called it Kaldadeb, or the Black Runner. Since it is smaller than Balafa, it doesn't have much effect on the world. But when it aligns with Balafa's orbit, it wreaks havoc on the tides and weather everywhere. This happens with an erratic frequency and severity and have been dubbed Lover's Tides. Kalda has been rolled into the Andra myth, and when they are both in sight, her desire to reach them is increased tenfold, which is what causes the terrible weather. So, not only is this re it's I, I really think this is super interesting that um there were these crazy tides people couldn't figure out what they were and there were astronomers who looked and they saw a separate moon that they aren't able to see with their naked eye i think that says so much about the history i think it's just such an interesting part of this world not only that i don't think it's a mistake that both of these books were in the same shelf here because um or in the same room anyway because this lover's tide was instrumental in the war of defiance and i don't know if there is a book about this in the world so i am going to find this in the guidebook and read a little bit about the war of defiance and the importance of the lover's tide okay here goes so i'm not going to read the whole thing on the war of defiance because we've heard a lot about it already um that is admet hadrit's uh, he started this war after declaring the Deerwood free from the Edir Empire um, and where they in the Deerwood gained their independence. But um, there is a portion of this that I do want to read aloud uh, because it is very um, linked to this idea of the lover's tide. Um, so in this section, it reads, One of the many coastal battles claimed the life of Admeth Hadrit, which only served to further unite Glenfothans and Deerwoodens under a shared banner. Because Admeth Hadrat was admired even by the Glenfothans. As the Emperor redoubled his invasion force, rebels feared that an incursion into New Dunred, now Defiance Bay, would mean their end. Galvin Medra and her team of Glenfothan astrologers came up with a gambit that would hopefully turn the war in their favor. In remembrance of Admeth, the inspiration for their scheme originated in tactics employed during the War of Black Trees. During the construction of New Dunred, engineers discovered that a nearby wetland had been drained centuries prior to expand the inhabitable region and fortify This is a battle of wills, Watcher. Shut up, Durrance. Um, since the land had ostensibly been reclaimed from the sea goddess Andra, they called that district Andra's Gift. As the largest battle of the war breached the city's walls, rebels held their position inland and baited Adiran forces into storming the Gift. An imperial armada circling the bay lent their support with cannon fire. Many lives were lost, holding the Adirans in part of their city, but the battle's success or failure would determine the outcome of the war. Then, just as the astrologers predicted, a full moon filled the sky. With it rode the Calda Dev, and the lover's tide battered the coast with a ferocity never before witnessed. So they predicted this lover's tide. And this happens like once every, I think it was like 325 years. So they predicted this, the astrologers. Uh, they knew this was going to happen. The violence of the ocean broke ships against the Adra Levy protecting New Dundred. Dundred. As the ancient fortification strained, seawater encroached in the districts occupied by Adiran soldiers. Many drowned or were dragged under the waves. Their numbers weakened and naval support splintered. They fled the city but not after sabotaging the dike that held the fury of the sea at bay. An unstoppable force of water flooded the district, and Andra took back her gift. In honor of the war, the city has been known as Defiance Bay. The Adiran Empire surveyed his losses and found he could no longer justify the war. He signed a treaty with Admeth's remaining earls, and the empire has remained bitterly distinct from the free palatinate of Deerwood ever since. So... Um, the war, of, this is basically the end of the War of Defiance. The Deerwood's independent is largely owes itself to the Lover's Tide and to the Glenfothan astrologer's ability to predict the Lover's Tide, which um, flooded Andra's gifts and large portions of then New Dundred, Dundred now Defiance Bay, um, while Adiran soldiers were in there, and the losses were so great that the Fyrkening and the Edir Empire couldn't uh, keep the war going. And because of that, that was the beginning of the end for the Adiran Empire's control over the Deerwood. Uh, so all that stuff, super interesting, I think anyway. 
Um, I, I don't know if you can hear that helicopter. I apologize. I live kind of close to an airport. Um, but yeah, moving on, uh, I'm so glad that all of these things kind of came at us at the exact same time so I could go into more detail. I was really wondering when I was going to go into that part of the War of Defiance, and uh, there it is. It's, it gave itself to us right here. So thank you, game, and thank you guys for listening. Um, I think that's all really interesting. Okay, um, so we are still in Deerford Village, though, and we are looking for Lady Elise. If this is a battle of wills, Watcher, I surrender. Freaking Durance just had to hold that one since I paused it. How do you do? Tell me about Lord Heron's daughter. He frowns and shrugs. His lordship says she up and went missing the other day. He wipes a tankard with his ragged towel, twisting it with a swift, jerking motion. I don't know any more than that. However, these lordling bastards handle their affairs. Ain't no business of mine. Before I display my corn pouch, I am going to use my perception to tell him that he looks agitated. Something about this doesn't sit right with you, does it? He slams the clean tankard down on the bar. Damn right it don't. That lord saunters in here like he's cut from cleaner cloth than the rest of us, and yet... He shakes his head. Look, I don't want no trouble from you or him or anybody else. I'm just waiting for him to tire my ale and leave so things can get back to normal around here. Here my benevolence comes into play. I won't stand by and allow an innocent girl to come to harm. Help me find her. He leans on the bar and sighs. Uh, that girl, Elise. She was looking to disappear. You should have seen her watching the door like a sheep at slaughter. All the same, she didn't hardly speak to no one. Only folk I seen her talk to is Trigal. He nods at the east window. His shop's by the broken tower. Bit of a hothead, that one. My advice is to let the matter drop. Like I say, it don't profit to dig around in other people's business. I understand, Dengler. Farewell. Okay, so, Dengler explained that Elise had become acquainted with Trigal, the local courier. His shop, is the one in the broken tower. So I think that's the next place to go. I wonder if Sid has something to Good say day here. To you. Nope. Some villagers here. Don't want to steal. Been in here? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've been in here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if the chapel priest has anything to say here. Oh, here's Medrith. An elf idles by the road, watching the village across the river. He nods as you approach, and the cowled figure standing near him falls silent. How do you do? Greetings, friend. A slow smile forms as he eyes you. I've heard of you. Word has it you've been busy in Defiance Bay. He draws closer. I'm busy, too, and eager to finish my business and get back to the city. What business is that? Haven't you heard? There's a murderer on the loose. Said to have gone mad with grief and strangled a dozen healthy children when her own was hollowborn. He nods at the, figure. He nods at the figures with him. Well, the way to Defiance Bay to bring her to justice. She's here? He nods across the river. She's hiding out in the village. We'd go in after her ourselves, but the problem is, she knows our faces. There's no telling what she'd do if she saw us coming. We'd be big to avoid any further unnecessary bloodshed. He leans closer. Her name's Nifer. She's an orderly. We want to get her out of town so that we can deal with her cleanly. She knows we're looking for her, but if someone were to convince her that it's safe to leave... If she's a mass murderer, why didn't the Duke send the Crucible Knights after her? The powers that be want to keep things quiet, for obvious reasons. Better not to cause a fuss, and certainly better to not start not to startle her into doing something drastic. I'm not so sure about this. He lays a strong hand on your shoulder. A mad woman like that is everybody's problem, friend. Just keep an eye out. Come across her. Remember what I told you. 
promise I'll make it worth your while. This guy seems sketchy, and I did run into Nifra in the inn. She was upstairs with a few people. I have a few questions for you. What is it? I'm also looking for a woman named Elise Heron. Have you seen her? Afraid not? I've just been watching for Nifra. Hail, traveler. What did Nifra do exactly? She was responsible for the murder of all those babies in Defiance Bay, remember? Terrible thing, but we'll make her pay, all right. I should get back to the search. Okay. Let's see if the priest here has anything to say about um, Elise. Uh, have you seen Lord Heron's daughter? I'm afraid not. Lord Heron's men already asked me, and that was the first I'd seen of any of his party. He holds a hand to his heart. Wherever she is, in this life or another, I hope he takes comfort that her soul is with Vareth. People in town say the Hollowborn problem has been especially bad here. It has. Cities and villages all over the Deerwood have seen Hollowborn, but Deerford hasn't seen the birth of an unaffected child in years. Most of our people have moved in, moved on to other villages in search of hope, and those who have stayed behind aren't the same. Children promise a future, you know? People change when you take that away from them. Uh, interesting look at the uh, Hollowborn here. First of all, this town seems to have been especially hard hit. Second of all, it's not every child. So there have been children that have been born. Um, but also, if children stop being born, like they have been in this village, um, then people start thinking that there is no future. Seems like a very natural way Bring back the fight. to react. There's a woman can do some damage squeezing her legs together. It isn't a parlor trick. Besides, she doesn't take orders well. She has backbone, that one. Does it scare you? No, but I won't be responsible for what happens if you call her whore. Well met, friends. I'm looking for a missing noblewoman. Oh, that lord's daughter? She was a new shade of green when I seen her the other morning, chatting with Trigal. She was just outside a shop. She points to the crumbling tower. You're talking about morning sickness. Was she pregnant? It's my survival skill that allows me to say that. She sighs. Aye, and worked into a state about it she was. That girl was so sick, sick she didn't even notice Tr Trigal's stink. I offered her some herbs to take care of the problem. Thought it might save her some trouble with the old man, but she wouldn't have it. What was wrong with her? No offense, but I hardly know you. I'm not one for gossip, and I certainly don't want to cause the poor girl trouble. That shouldn't have been there, I don't think. I already know that it's morning sickness. Uh, Lord Heron said she was ill from travel. She laughs. That were no road sickness. Trust me, I know it when I see it. Hey, Thanks for the travel. information. Very well. Uh, yeah, so Dinah mentioned that Elise was pregnant. Welcome. I'm looking for a young woman named Elise. That lord's got you asking around too, eh? He grunts. At least you ask politely enough. Bad enough having a small army move into town, but then they start throwing their weight around and telling you your business. He shakes his head and clucks. What's the problem with these lords? They think their money and their family name entitle them to some kind of special treatment. They expect everyone to fawn over them the way their servants do. No, sir. That's not the kind of people we are, not in the Deerwood. We broke away from Edder to get away from that kind of nonsense. If they think... <laughs> Either Sid or the innkeeper did say that this guy talks too much. I certainly understand why you feel that way, but at the moment, I'm just looking for his daughter. Of course, of course, I was just getting to her, he clears his throat. I haven't seen her, not since she went missing anyway. 
She mostly kept to herself. He shrugs and wipes the buckler again. But you know how women are, always carrying on full of caliber once you get any two of them together. Perfectly harmless, mind you. I'm not criticizing. This feels like they never run out of things to say. The girl seemed rather quiet, downright shy if I do say so, but even Hedina got her talking. Just goes to show you. Hedina. An alchemist. Runs a small stand near the cell. Okay, we know who she is. Okay, farewell. <clears throat> Alright, let's finally tr talk to Trining. Hope this isn't premature. We should find out more first. Oh. You know what, before we do this, let's go talk to Nifra, I think her name is. Hello. Someone told me you were responsible for heinous killings in the Fiends Bay. Let me guess. Was that someone named Medrith? She draws her stiletto. You're a big shot with Crucible Knights. If I'd gone on some kind of rampage, don't you think you'd have heard about it? She shakes her head. Got on the wrong side of his employers, and now he's after me. But if you're here to do his dirty work, I won't make it easy on you. Relax. I just want to hear your side of the story. What story? The Dominels came after me. I just happened to rob the wrong place. How was I supposed to know they'd already claimed it? She runs her hands under her hood and through her hair. It was an honest mistake. I'm just trying to survive now, and if you spoke with Medrith, you know where he's waiting. Please, help me get out of here. Go east. Medrith's waiting for you, just west of the river. That seems more likely of a story than the one Medrith was telling us, especially if he's with the Dominels. She nods, slowly. All right, I'm trusting you. Don't have much of a choice. See if you can send him the other way. That should buy me some time. She follows the hooded figures toward the stairs, giving a final uncertain glance as she passes through the door. And now I need to also direct Medrith away from Nifra, but first, Adair and Bjarta just leveled up. So for Adair, I upped his athletics by one, so now he has an athletics of 10, and I granted him weapon and shield style. Equipped shields deflection uh, bonuses are increased and grant an equal bonus to the character's reflex. And for Bjartr, I upped his lore to one, uh, up one, so now he's got a lore of seven. And I granted him Eye Strike, a level one cipher spell that I missed. Hopefully this is helpful. Shocks an enemy's visual receptors, dazing and blinding them, as well as blinding nearby targets. Um, so that might be really useful. And I also granted him Psychic Backlash, which invokes a retaliatory strike, stunning an enemy whenever they target the cipher's will defense. Okay, so first let's go talk to Medrith and tell him that she went west. Actually, I'm going to talk to Lord Heron, see if he knows anything about her being pregnant. Yes. Have you news of Elise? Yeah, can't say anything to him. Um, let's see if Rumbald has anything to say about Elise. Hail, traveler. Seen any sign of Elise Herond? His hands curling the knobby fists. How many times do I have to repeat myself? I already told those snooping guards I haven't seen her. But that hasn't kept him from nosing around my property. Need something else? Hello. Found Nefer yet. I'm ready to get out of here. I'm just going to say she snuck out the back of the end, in, and went north. He squints at you, pulling the grass into two flimsy threads. Did she now? And how would you know that? Well, I can't do this Resolve 14, so I was just hoping you'd believe me. Medrith draws his blade. Don't worry, I'll catch up to her, right after I take care of you. Can't say I <clears throat> didn't want to kill these guys here. 
Let's cast Eye Strike right now. Just leveled up. Thank you. Alright. Kana first. Go for Kana. I increased his stealth by one. I think he's a stealth of six now, maybe five. I uh, gave him uh, Rejoice, my comrades, two fingers of daylight. Um, which requires four phrases chanted. The chanter creates two bouncing beams of pure light that restore endurance and grant immunity to frightened and terrified. Uh, that restore endurance and grant immunity to frightened and terrified on all allies struck by it. Next, Aloth. For Aloth, I increase his mechanics by one. I think he has six or seven now. Uh, thrust of Tattered Veils. This is just a level 1 spell, but a quick strike of crushing force dealing little damage, but having a high chance to disrupt enemy spellcasters. So that might be good, um, because a lot of times the spellcasters hang back, so it's tough for me to get to them without uh, being disengaged. Um, so hopefully that could kind of help. Um, and then for the talents, I, have, I got Arcane Veil, which conjures a protective shield of magic, dramatically boosting the wizard's deflection. Um, that's especially like when he starts taking damage, it'd be good to, um, put that on so that hopefully I don't, uh, lose endurance as quickly. Next, endurance. For endurance, I upped his mechanics by one, so he now has a mechanics of eight. And I gave him, uh, interdiction, which condemns the priest's foes, dazing any enemies in the area of effect. That is a once per encounter. And finally, Sagani. For Sagani, I gave her survival plus one, so she now has a survival of 11. And I gave her the talent accurate wounding shot. The ranger's aim becomes deadlier, making his or her wounding shots more accurate. Okay, so Medrid's dead. Is that quest done? I think it is. I think we are done with Nipra. And that probably didn't. Um, <clears throat> make the Dominels like us anymore. They already really don't like us. Part of me wants to go to Deerford Crossing before I ask, uh, what's his name, try something about Elise, but I'll go ask that now. Trago wipes a splotch of dye from his elbow with a shirt tail. Something else you need. What can you tell me about Elise Herond? He shrugs. Only that her father's men have been banging down doors and stirring up trouble looking for her. I never met her myself. Hmm. And Dinah said you two had met. He folds his arms, the smell of tallow and animal dung wafting off of him. Did she now? And what else did she say? The young woman was intoxicated by your presence. He laughs. Your flattery don't fool me. Her father's dragged her out here to get hitched in some backwoods noble. She wanted to escape all right, and I was happy to give it to her. We snuck across the river a few nights ago for some private time. Come to find out, we weren't exactly alone. An ogre, taller than Winfrey's tails, sprung out of the forest, and we were so lost in the heat of the moment we didn't notice it until it was upon us. 
I grabbed the lease, disappeared into the night before I could even pull my britches up. I'm going to use my perception here to say, don't take this the wrong way, but this shop smells like an outhouse. Am I really to believe that a lord's daughter snuck into the woods with you? Trigal scowls. Curb that clever tongue of yours. I'm afraid there's no right way to take that, stranger. Just tell me what really happened. I don't repeat myself. Not for you and not for some noble's toadies either. He wiped his dye-stained hands on his trousers and turns back to his work. Okay. Blood Legacy. Trigal claims an ogre took Elise somewhere near the Bale River east of Deerford. While I have a hard time believing she snuck away with him, there may still be some clues in the wilderness. So even though I'm pretty sure she did not sneak away with Trigal for some tryst, um, it seems like Deerford Crossing is the next place for us to go. But um, that will have to wait for next session because we are just about out of time for this one. So thank you again for joining me. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed hearing about this. I especially love that we got to talk of the War of Defiance and the Lover's Tide. I thought that stuff was super interesting. Um, and I think uh, Deerford itself is actually really interesting too. So um, hopefully you are getting as much out of this as I am. And hopefully, again, I will see you for session 37 um, next time. So thanks all for watching, and I will see you then. Bye.